So uh, we're going to talk about uh, streaming microservices, and the first question is uh, why streaming? And um, as you know, the majority of the application in general the batch, but the real life is streams, and we have to adapt to the real life. And uh, there is another reason why streaming is so important is because uh, the majority of companies wants to know what is happening right now, not two days or even three hours after the things has happened. So uh, Dean wrote a book a couple of years ago. It's a little bit dated, but it's still very relevant. And uh, he is talking about uh, different architecture for streaming and for fast data. So in his book, he is proposing the overall architecture for uh, streaming data. And in this talk, we will only concentrate on a couple of things. We will talk about Kafka as the data backbone, and we will talk about Aka streams and Kafka streams for implementation of the streaming. So the first question is, why Kafka? I mean, how many people in the audience have been using Kafka so far? Quite a few. So. Uh, what is Kafka? A lot of people are saying Kafka is a messaging system, which technically is wrong. Kafka is a log. It's a distributed log. Uh, and uh, in this sense, it's quite different from the messaging system. It can be used as a messaging system, but it would be very wrong to call Kafka a messaging system. And there are quite a few differences which are important. The most important one is uh, in messaging system, messages are ephemeral. In Kafka, they are stored on disk, which gives you the capability of replaying the messages, which is becoming extremely important. The second thing is uh, Kafka created sort of revolution in the messaging um, implementation because traditionally messaging system we are keeping track of the consumers and this is where the limitation on the scalability was. Kafka is the first one that is not trying to keep this track. Instead, every consumer is keeping track where in the log he is, which basically means that uh, they expand the scalability, and uh, there can be unlimited, virtually unlimited amount of consumers that can connect to Kafka. So in Kafka, what is happening is the producer always writes to the end of the log, and uh, each consumer is uh, reading from the position where he stopped. Uh, the basic thing in uh, Kafka is a topic, um, where in reality a topic is uh, not a real thing. It is a convenience aggregation of multiple partitions. So the true element of Kafka is partition. And uh, when people are talking about preserving the sequence of the messages, they're really not topic ab uh, talking about uh, topics, they're talking about partitions. Within the topic, uh, within the partition, uh, the sequence of the messages is guaranteed within the partition. Uh, within the topic, it's not. So topic is just nothing else but convenience logical aggregation of partitions. So uh, prior to introduction of Kafka and uh, generally prior to introduction of uh, messaging, uh, this is what people had to deal with. So if uh, the service wanted to invoke another service, it has to know where the other service is located. It has to know some additional things about this service. For example, what kind of requests it accepts. Is it pure HTTP? Is it gRPC? Something else. So basically, without uh, having Kafka as a backbone, uh, you have the web of ad hoc connections, and it's very hard to try to figure out 
was going on. So by introducing Kafka, this allows to simplify the connectivity quite a bit because all the messages are going through the Kafka. And um, to be more precise, I'm talking about Kafka, but in reality, it can be Kafka, it can be a Pravega, it can be Apache distributed log. They all provide similar kind of functionality and similar kind of APIs. So why is it important? It's better decoupling because now you have a complete temporal decoupling uh, because Kafka allows you to store messages persistently. So if your recipient will go down, it doesn't really matter too much because uh, the messages are going to be stored in the log and when he will come back up, uh, he will start receiving these messages. It uh, simplifies dependencies because uh, in this case, uh, your provider doesn't really care who the consumers are. He writes to the log and uh, you can add any amount of consumers. Nothing is going to change. And of course, there is a simplicity of uh, a single APIs for majority of communications. Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit about, okay, so this is Kafka as a backbone. Now we can start talking about <coughs> streaming engines. And uh, there are two approaches. Traditional approach is based on uh, my produce that uh, became extremely popular with the big data. And as a result, all the first implementations of the streaming uh, engines, for example, Storm, uh, for example, Spark streaming, we are kind of bringing the same architecture to streaming. Uh, so this is what is called uh, my produced streaming styles. So stream engines are today the most popular are uh, Spark streaming and Flink. Uh, those are services to which uh, you kind of uh, submit your work and uh, they scale, uh, they do automatic partitioning, they do failover and recovery, they provide a lot of things behind the scenes. So if we look at a Spark example, what is happening is your Spark driver talks to the cluster manager, cluster manager decides where to put your executors, if uh, your scale will start to increase, it may add additional amount of executors, or you might have to uh, manually specify more amount of executors in your application, but it will do all this for you. It's also do a lot of additional things because uh, on the right hand side is how you write your code and now Spark with its optimizer because it knows the full code, it will decide what to execute where and at which point to do shuffle. And uh, this is great but uh, it doesn't come for free. Uh, the problem with this approach is First of all, it becomes uh, the issue of the cost of ownership. You have to have a server, and you have to have a group that supports the server. It also becomes uh, the issue of programming model, because uh, every server of this type dictates the programming model that you have to adhere to in order to execute, and it's wonderful if your application fits well into this programming model. If it doesn't, you might be in a big trouble. It also dictates uh, the deployment model. Uh, so you have to have your server writing. You have to have uh, to create assembly Uber jar. You have to submit your Uber jar to the server. All this becomes uh, not so convenient, so you have to weight uh, the price that you are paying versus the advantages that you are getting out of this. So as a result, uh, several years ago, people started to think about using uh, microservices for streaming, and one of the breakthrough was uh, Jay Crab's article about uh, Kafka streams and uh, 
the whole idea behind this was um, there is a certain um, difference between batch processing and streaming processing because batch usually assume a humongous amount of data that you have to, pro to process, where in a streaming case, typically you're dealing with the short, small amount of data that uh, is relevant for this particular moment. So people started thinking that maybe using um, application server is not always the appropriate tool for doing uh, streaming applications. Uh, so we will talk about uh, two most popular libraries. Uh, one of them, uh, uh, disclaimer, I work for Lightband. That's why I assume that Aka is the best thing in the world or at least I'm supposed to think this way. And uh, there is uh, another very popular library, which is Kafka Streams. And um, I'll try to show one example comparing the two. So <clears throat> there are different uh, microservices, and technically they are coming uh, from the different uh, design philosophies. Um, there is an uh, event-driven uh, philosophy where every element of data has its own identity, and this identity um, is important because every message has to be processed by itself. Uh, very clever animation. Let me finish this uh, first. Uh, um, and uh, there is a second uh, uh, type of uh, approach uh, that uh, is also popular, and this is processing messages in bulk where the identity of the individual message doesn't matter so much. What is important is the aggregated data that exists in the set of messages. Uh, so, Aka Streams uh, emerged uh, from the event-driven microservices because in Aka Streams, every message is an individual message and you can route it differently, you can process it uh, differently. Kafka Streams emerged uh, from the other side, uh, kind of similar to what uh, Spark Streaming does to what Flink does, uh, they typically treat not individual messages, but uh, they treat the collection of messaging and messages, and we'll talk a little bit later about windowing. This is one of the approaches. But uh, what is happening in reality, these two paradigms are merging, and technically you can use Aka Streams to process bulk, and you can use Kafka Streams alternatively to process individual messages. So let's start uh, from uh, Kafka Streams. So Kafka Streams is a fairly new library. Um, it has uh, all the, the word here is probably not important, but rather fashionable. Uh, it has all the fashionable stream processing, uh, semantic, uh, distinguishing between event time and processing time, windowing support, uh, group within the window. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, if you look at what is happening, uh, several years ago, uh, Google and Apache introduced their application server, which is called Beam. And they were actually the first one uh, that we are defining all the semantics. Uh, they were the first one that came up with distinguishment between the event occurrence time and event processing time. They were very careful about windowing. And this is extremely important if you are trying to use this type of engines to build analytical applications. Um, several conversations that we were trying to have with Google guys were, well, 
this is great, but analytical applications are not the only one applications that are important for streaming. So we need to enhance uh, these capabilities. So the two fundamental uh, elements in Kafka Streams are K-Stream, which allow you pure record transformation and one-to-one -one mapping. And it also has a K-Table, which is a key value table, uh, which allows you to store a value by key and is useful for holding uh, store values. One of the things that um, Confluent was extremely good at is when they've introduced these two things, they've also introduced an extremely important notion of uh, stream table duality, which obvious to anybody who ever used the normal SQL databases because you first write to the log and then you have the table. <laughs> and they formalized this as much as they could, and now this becomes um, extremely important notions. Stream is a representation in time of the table, and table is the collection of the data that came through the stream. But uh, in all fairness, they were the first one that we were running with this, and this became very important. Um, so Kafka Streams allows you to read and write to Kafka topics or in memory or in the table. This is the nice thing about uh, Kafka Streams. So table APIs and KStream APIs are very similar. And when you write your code, you can mix and match the operations on KStream and KTable. And uh, it does uh, load balancing and scale using topic partitioning. This is um, another important uh, thing that, uh, let me stop here for a second. So the way Kafka works is uh, because Kafka Streams is basically Kafka consumer or Kafka producer, so it abides by the same rules. But the way Kafka works is, if you have a topic with five partitions, you can have five consumers, each dedicated to a single topic, uh, to, to a single partition of the topic. If you have less than five, then what is happening is Kafka will assign to some of them more than one partition. If you have more than five, what is going to happen is five are going to process each individual partition, and all the other ones are going to be there as hot spares. So there is this coupling, and uh, Kafka Streams is leveraging uh, this uh, for its uh, scalability. Um, Kafka Streams, uh, Confluent uh, made uh, a very specific decision. The, the only API that they are providing uh, is Java APIs, and uh, at this point, it was light band for the rescue. And uh, we have created the Scala APIs, and I will talk later today about details of the Scala APIs um, implementation. And uh, Kafka Streams also have uh, the thing which is called KSQL, which, uh, yeah, I'm filmed right now, so I better watch my tongue. Um, it's kind of a strange thing because uh, SQL is uh, widely adopted in uh, many stream streaming engines, for example, uh, Spark Structure Streaming and Fling, but uh, the way it works there is you can use SQL as a programming language. Basically, SQL allows you to define your transformation instead of writing code. Kafka Streams decided to implement uh, their KSQL slightly differently, so you can't use SQL in your Kafka Streams applications. KSQL is a separate application where you can do SQL and nothing else. So for me, it's a little bit strange. I would rather see them doing the same thing that Flink is doing. And um, 
we're doing okay on time. So Flink has uh, this uh, wonderful thing. Uh, if you know, one of the biggest uh, Flink users is Alibaba. And Alibaba basically banned all of the development for Flink except for SQL. So they are writing all of their applications in SQL. This is absolutely amazing. We are talking about the most modern programming languages, which is Scala. And the majority of developers are absolutely happy not to know anything about this and use 30 years old SQL. And according to Alibaba, this is the highest productivity that they've ever achieved. I'm sorry, I'm not doing this on purpose. It's just amazing to me. <laughs> um, so uh, the example that uh, I will show is uh, the example from, this time it's my book, uh, model surfing book. Well, I can't use Dean all the time. I have to have something of my own. Um, and uh, for this example, we will use, uh, of course, I work for Lightband. We are going to use the new Scala APIs that are finally now part of Kafka Streams distribution. And uh, if you are interested, we also have uh, support uh, in uh, Scala and Aka HTTP for queryable state. And uh, Okay, uh, so if you want to see the full code, uh, this is uh, the Git repo, and uh, we are going to give this tutorial next week, hopefully within this time, uh, at uh, Strata London. So let's uh, look at the code. Uh, this is... Um, Kafka stream code, which is uh, surprisingly simple. So first we create the builder. Uh, and uh, this is the new Scala APIs, fresh of the press. Uh, we create uh, uh, the components that we need uh, there. Uh, we do and uh, we specify that the data is coming from uh, Kafka queues, and we are specifying that format of the data is byte arrays. Uh, we are doing uh, the model, and if you guys know Spark or Flink, you will see that it's very similar functional APIs. Uh, we do the second mapping. After that, we instantiate the streams, and then we say streams run, and we add shutdown hook so that it exits cleanly. That's all it takes to write a simple uh, Kafka streams code. So uh, this would be f wonderful, but uh, we have now, as we're not using the server and we're using library, we have to deal with all these problems, what to do with the scalability. And I've talked a little bit that we can leverage the Kafka scalability, which is built into Kafka. What do with failover, you are completely on your own. And uh, what to do with restartability, you have to write scripts. So uh, the morale of this story is there is no free lunch. You gain more flexibility and uh, implementation simplicity, but you have to worry about infrastructure concerns. Aka streams. Uh, you guys have heard multiple presentations in the last two days about Aka streams. This is the best thing since sliced bread. And I'm not just saying this because I work for light band. I truly believe in this. Well, maybe not, but uh, it's uh, based on uh, reactive streams and it has the back pressure. And this is a quick refresher of what back pressure is. I'm sure uh, you all heard uh, in the last two days about back pressure. So basically the idea is you have the bounded queue 
and you can control the speed with which producer is producing the new messages. This is how you basically achieve reactive streams. And the wonderful thing is uh, it composes quite nicely. So if you have a, a composition of reactive stream, you have reactive all the way through. Um, so Aka Streams is part of the Aka ecosystem, which also includes Aka Actors, Aka Cluster, Aka HTTP, Aka Persistence, and many other pieces. It uh, also uh, has Alpaca for connectivity to different sources, and I'm happy to say we've kind of rebooted Alpaca development. We have more people that now are dedicated fully to Alpaca projects, so hopefully things will start to move a little bit faster, and they have very low overhead and latency. So. Um, this is the most simplistic Aka Streams application, and what I wanted to show here is uh, the typical Aka Streams application has a source. It has a flow, which processes the data from the source, and it has the sync, which outputs the results of the execution. So this is uh, the standard uh, development paradigm for Aka Streams, and one of the things that I find very convenient is I can just write, draw my processing as a graph and then just go and implement the picture, and this is why I think it is so convenient and works so nicely. Uh, so let's look at the same example that we have looked at with uh, Kafka Streams, uh, but implemented in Aka Streams. Um, if you look at the code, you will see that it's kind of similar. It's more or less the same thing, and what it has, it, it has uh, the ceremony which is necessary to enable uh, Aka Streams applications, which is a defining system, materializer, execution context. Uh, then uh, what you have is uh, you have kind of similar definitions. Uh, one thing here is uh, we've been using a custom graph stage to implement processing logic. And uh, the rest looks pretty much very similar to what we've seen with Kafka Streams. So uh, there is a whole bunch of other concerns that we can address uh, because Kafka um, Streams is a very rich ecosystem. Um, we can uh, scale the things quite nicely because in this particular example, every scoring engine is working with a particular model, so we can integrate uh, Aka Streams with Aka Actors, allowing individual actor to process requests of the certain data type, and the advantage of this is if Kafka Streams is inherently single-threaded, here by introducing actors, we can parallelize and we can process different data types in parallel, which is becoming by far faster. We can go even further and introduce Aka Cluster so that we can do parallelization across multiple machines. Um, we can... Uh, Persist the execution uh, through Aka persistence. I mean, in all fairness, Kafka persistence, if you write things in table, tables are backed up by Kafka queues. So those are on par functionality. And uh, we also can connect to anything using Alpaca. I mean, the point of this slide is that Aka is such a rich ecosystem. You can do a lot of things by combining pieces of the Aka ecosystems together to build your application. This is um, another 
issue that uh, always comes up in this kind of system. How do you do connectivity between the components? At which point uh, do you do direct connectivity in memory? At which point you are using Kafka as the intermediary? And uh, because uh, my role in the company is architect, my standard answer to everything is it depends what you're trying to achieve. <laughs> Well, it really depends, what can I do? Uh, so if uh, you are doing in-memory connectivity, your overhead is uh, extremely low, your performance is extremely high, um, your application is extremely brittle because making changes is hard. Uh, if you are trying to do it through Kafka, uh, you are losing in latency, you are losing in processing because you need to marshal and marshal data every time when you do the hub, but uh, you gain a lot uh, because uh, you can do independent scalability of components, you can slide additional component that is using the same data without changing what you have already. So it really, you have to evaluate what your main criteria is and go from there. Uh, so again, uh, if you are, this is more consideration between the two architectures and connectivity. So this is, uh, for the most part, what I wanted to say, which is nice, I'm letting you early to lunch. It's always hard to present right before lunch because people are angry with you if you run over time. Uh, this is, again, uh, I'm using this to promote what we're doing in Lightband. This is Lightband uh, Fast Data Platform. and. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. And it looks like people are so hungry, nobody wants to yes. ask the question. No, there is something there. We have one question. Uh, you mentioned in passing, I think, that one of the advantages is that Arca is a rich ecosystem and therefore uh, you can also combine uh, streams with Arca persistence. Can you talk a little bit about how that would look in practice? Uh, yeah, in reality, you don't uh, combine directly streams with Arca persistence. What you do is you combine streams with actors, and then through actors, you are using persistence. Okay. Uh, as Dean would say in my place, there is nothing that you can't achieve with one more level of interaction. Makes sense. Thanks. <laughs> 